I'm Jacinta. I'm a speech pathologist and a PhD candidate with CPHE. And today I'm going to be talking about including young people with complex communication needs in research by optimising informed consent procedures. And this presentation is based on a, uh, a poster that I had at the Australian Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine in Cairns. Um, that, and it's based on some work that I've done with uh, consumer advisors on my PhD and also work that Megan Walsh, another speechy and PhD candidate, has done with her consumer advisors on her PhD work. Um, so to get started, um, I wanted to start by saying that everybody should be able to choose to participate in research and that unfortunately people with communication disabilities are often excluded for, from participating in research projects which has a significant impact on the field's knowledge and it limits the development of effective evidence-based practices. And in the NHMRC national statement, it says that people with cognitive impairment, uh, an intellectual disability or mental illness are entitled to participate in research and to do so for altruistic reasons. And I acknowledge that uh, communication disability is not the same as cognitive impairment and, and intellectual disability, but I think um, this statement from the national statement is quite nice in saying that they are entitled to do so um, and they're entitled to do so for altruistic reasons. So researchers um, need, researchers must acknowledge that some participants may have communication disability and they need to account for this when they develop their study protocol. And again, in the national statement, it says that the research design should take into account factors that may affect the capacity to receive information, to consent to research, or to participate in it. And it says that people might have impaired capacity for verbal or written communication, but that provision should be made for them to receive information and to express their wishes in other ways. So all of this is to say that including people with communication disability in research um, is, is actually stipulated in the national statement, which tells us about how we should be doing research. So to enhance the participation of people with communication disability in research, we need to embed flexibility within study protocols. And that's not just for data collection methods, but it's also for consent. So a lot of people have flexible data collection methods. They might do interviews and have creative ways of doing interviews like photo voice and things like that. But also for consent, there needs to be flexible ways of, um, of obtaining consent from participants. So you might have several consent methods and you choose the most appropriate one for each participant. And the study protocols should describe those in detail. Some people with communication disability might be able to use standard written consent procedures um, and those should be made available to them because we don't wanna make um, providing consent an unintentionally difficult and laborious or disengaging process for people who could use the standard written procedures, but then other people will require different methods. So this is an adapted informed verbal consent uh, procedure that I'm working with in my, um, in my current PhD study. Um, and essentially at an, at an initial meeting with a potential participant, I would ask them how they indicate yes and no, how they show that they're unsure about something. I would say, um, you're allowed to take breaks or stop at any time. How will I know if you want to take a break or stop? How will I know if you're upset or worried during the interview? And I might ask it as an open question um, or if they're having some trouble coming up with ways that they go, that they might tell me that they need a break. I might give options. I could say, every 10 minutes, do you want me to do a check-in? Um, will, you, will you use a specific gesture or a specific word on your device or your support person um, be able to tell and will they, will, they, will they tell me on your behalf? So I might give them some options to see what would work best for them. And then I would also check how they want, if, how they would tell me they need to stop or they want to withdraw consent. So I would establish those things at the beginning. Then I would provide information about the study in an accessible format. So I might, um, if they have certain communication aids, I might use them. If they need visuals, I could um, use some visuals. Being a speech, I have some that I can kind of just like rummage through and grab. Um, but if I know beforehand how they communicate, I can make sure that I've got, you know, some, um, some things. So uh, 
I might say, I'm going to keep a video of this meeting, only other researchers will see it so they can help me with the research. Is that okay? Or how do you feel about that? I won't tell anyone else about what we talk about unless I think you're hurting yourself or you're, or someone is hurting you. Is that okay? Or how do you feel about that? So that I'm going through the different parts of the study and checking that they're okay with it. And then at the end, I would say, how do you feel about taking part today? Or how do you feel about having a chat with me today? So I included all of that information, um, those steps in my study protocol, um, but I thought I would also include some hypothetical participants and some vignettes to describe um, what it might look like in practice. So I've included here the hypothetical participants that I put in my study protocol so that you could see. So this is Raf. he is 11. He has no receptive language deficits. He uses an eye gaze device with a Rig 3 and QWERTY keyboard expressively. The device is mounted to his power wheelchair and his support people make sure that the device is always charged and on. He types phrases and sentences to communicate, but it takes a bit of time as he needs to work really hard on his head control. And he uses approximations, um, uses approximations of head nodding and shaking to say yes and no. And it can be hard for an unfamiliar person to understand and recognize the recognize the approximations, but once you know what it looks like, it's pretty clear. Um, his yes and no is pretty clear. So to obtain consent from RAF, I would provide him with information about the study first. And since he's got typical receptive language, I would use um, just typical age appropriate information, the child information sheet, and I used the template from the Royal Children's Hospital, that information sheet. I'd also provide that info to his parent um, because Rafi is 11 years old, so we'd also need parental consent. And then I would go through the informed adapted verbal consent process that I just um, uh, described, and I would incorporate his device and his head movements into it, um, into that process as well. And his parent would support me to learn about his communication. And I allow plenty of time for him to use the QWERTY keyboard um, to answer the open questions and pay close attention to his head movements. And then if he consents to participate in the study, I would also then obtain formed consent from his parent. So that's one example. The next example is Gwen. She's another hypothetical participant. She's 22 years old. She has moderate to severe intellectual disabilities, so has receptive and expressive language deficits. She uses a 20-cell pod book for both receptive input and expressive communication. And I don't have a whole pod book with me, but I have one page just roughly. So a pod book has lots and lots of these, these pages. Um, and so she uses a 20 cell pod book for receptive and expressive communication and combines two to three symbols to um, create a message. And she's also a multimodal communicator. So she uses different methods of communication put together to send her message across. So for instance, if she wanted to say that her leg was sore, she would vocalize, make eye contact with her communication partner and grimace. She would point to something's wrong in her pod, something's wrong, um, and then sore in her pod, and then she would reach towards her leg. So that shows you that she's using different methods to communicate. She uses picture communication symbols. I've got one, I don't have no, but I've got yes. Um, she points to these to say yes and no, um, and to, obs to obtain consent from Gwen, I would provide her with info about the study, um, because this is informed consent, not just consent. And so since she's got impaired receptive language, I would use her pod book to, to help her understanding. I might say this activity is about feelings. I'm going to ask you questions and you can tell me what you think with your pod. And the words in uh, square brackets are, symbols in, in the book. I'd also give her the young person information sheet, um, provide information about the study to her guardian and go through that informed adapted consent process, incorporating her pod book as well. And her um, parent or guardian can support me to learn more about her communication. And then if she consents, obtain consent from her guardian. So in practice, I've been using this method on a study, on my current study, which aims to explore and describe the mental health experiences of young people with complex communication needs. And it's the, the methods, they're going well. Um, 
my main learning though is about finding the balance between ensuring that the consent procedure is thorough but it's not so laborious that the, the participant has to work extremely hard just to say yes that they want to participate so it's about finding that balance between the two um, and a quick little plug if you use AAC and want to be involved these are the study details um, and thank you for listening